The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Wind turbines, the telephone, paint that repels water and dirt, Olympic swimming suits. What do all these products have in common? Believe it or not, they all began as ideas inspired by nature. And it's nothing new. Since the 15th century, engineers have been looking to the natural world for design ideas. Studying birds motivated Leonardo da Vinci to draw plans for a helicopter and hang glider. And perhaps the most famous modern example is Velcro, which was designed by a Swiss engineer in 1948 who was inspired by the cockleburs he pulled from his dog's fur. If we look towards the diversity of nature, we see it's just extraordinary performance at every level, from molecules to uh, whole organisms. They can do things that we just can't do in terms of flying, running, uh, swimming. We can't even come close to building things as fast and as maneuverable as nature. But if we could only extract those principles, we may be able to design something completely different. Nature's been coming up with new designs through millions of years of gene mutations. But only over the last few decades have humans become sophisticated enough to draw on nature's elegantly evolved solutions and apply them to create significant man-made innovations. And as our human technologies take on more of the characteristics of nature, nature becomes a lot better teacher. It's called biomimicry, the relatively new scientific practice of studying systems and elements in nature and adapting them to solve modern human problems. But as biologist Robert Full explains, this design strategy isn't nearly as simple as it sounds. It's often thought that biomimicry is just looking at nature and being able then to copy it in some way. It turns out to be much more difficult. Because organisms are not optimally designed, we have to do very rigorous studies to understand the history of their evolution and their design compromises so that we can extract the general principles and give the best advice possible to engineers. Because then you can put the same multi-electrode harness in there yeah. and do a multi In his lab at the University of California, Berkeley, Full works to refine this growing science, which he refers to as bioinspiration. He says it's based on the concept that evolution doesn't necessarily generate perfect design results. To evolve, you just have to survive. If we look at evolution, what we see is that it's not really an optimizing principle. It's kind of a just good enough principle. And that's very different from the way we think about how to design things in engineering. Engineering uh, has a particular goal, an end goal, and evolution doesn't. And nature offers plenty of examples of this just good enough design. Throughout evolution, we know that organisms have changed, but they haven't removed and changed over all their parts. For example, we wouldn't want to copy a whale as it exists today because they have pelvic bones. Uh, we know why they're there through evolution, but they don't you know, function today that will allow the, the whale to, to swim better. That would be sort of silly to copy. In order to figure out how nature's most artful designs actually work, biologists like Bob Full and his team must dig deep enough to separate nature's best developments from its useless leftovers. For example, we wanted to know how things could climb. And so we picked the gecko. They're spectacularly good at that, and we didn't know why. They can run up a wall at a meter a second and take 30 steps in that one second and pull their toes off in milliseconds, thousands of a second. And we didn't know how they could do that. So we zoomed in on the toes, and what we found is the toes have these leaf-like structures with millions of hairs. They kind of look like a rug. And each individual hair has the worst case of split ends possible, so 100 to 1,000 split ends. And it's those tiny little tips, those little split ends, that get very close to the surface. And they stick not by glue or by suction or like Velcro, but they actually stick by intermolecular forces alone. It's one thing to observe the design of a gecko's foot, and another to make a working model. In 1998, Bob Full partnered with UC Berkeley engineering professor Ron Fearing to help move his diverse biological research into the realm of human engineering. It took us three months to figure out 
how to get a gecko hair to, to adhere. And the secret turned out to be that you had to take the hair and drag it against the surface just like the, the gecko does. Otherwise, it won't, it won't adhere. And in hindsight, this looks like a, a pretty obvious thing because, of course, the gecko can't just be running around sticking to everything. It, the gecko has to be able to turn its stickiness on and off. And it does this by, by dragging its foot against the surface when it wants to adhere and peeling up when it wants to come off. After analyzing dozens of climbing geckos, they discovered that the adhesive nature of its foot is highly directional and it's self-cleaning. It will adhere over and over again without losing its stickiness. Using this data, Fearing and his students have fabricated a synthetic tape prototype that works on these same principles. So the way we're making the, the gecko adhesive is basically to take a uh, sheet of plastic, very thin plastic, and we mold hairs onto the surface of the, of the plastic. So we end up with a, a film with um, about 40 million fibers per, per square centimeter. We use a thermoplastic, so we melt it and cast it into a mold, and then we remove the mold by etching. And we end up with uh, patches of gecko adhesive that are a couple centimeters on the side. UC Berkeley engineering graduate student Zhang Ho Lee developed an experiment to test its strength. He applies a small tape sample to a clean glass surface, then hangs a weight from it. The bright areas show where the microscopic fibers are making contact with the surface of the glass. By illuminating these sticky spots, he shows how the contact area grows as the load grows. In other words, the heavier the force acting against it, the stronger the tape adheres, just like a gecko's toe. We never thought about making an adhesive out of hairs uh, until we looked at the gecko. And that we believe that engineers would never have looked at this kind of solution for a novel adhesive. It just shows how important curiosity-based research really is. So what's next? How about an entire robotic gecko? That's pretty much the idea behind StickyBot, developed at Stanford University by Professor Mark Kokoski and designed by his doctoral student Songbae Kim. It was inspired by Bob Full's gecko research, and it's the first robot that can actually scale smooth vertical surfaces. Learning from nature really actually is a two-way street. So biologists like us discover the general principles of function give those ideas to the engineers. They build something that's never been built before. In doing that, they have lots of questions, and they then generate ideas to allow us to go back and discover new things about the animals. So there's a real synergy when it works well. And the gecko is only one tiny example of what nature has to offer. Bob Pohl has also been inspired by the locomotive capabilities of a variety of other animals. His work has led to the design of remarkable robots, creatures with surprisingly organic capabilities. Our work on cockroaches and other uh, diverse legged animals allowed us to look at the general principles about how legs are built, and that led to the incredible uh, running robot Rex. Well, this is Rex's cousin, RespondBot. So Rex's cousin can go over incredibly difficult terrain, so very rough, and the way it does it is it uses its springy legs to sort of bounce back, forth, and it does so in a way that it tends to stabilize itself. Robots like these will one day have many uses. For example, they can carry an array of sensors and go places that are too dangerous or small for humans to go. This makes them invaluable for military surveillance and search and rescue missions following earthquakes or chemical accidents. Full's overwhelming success at breaking down the wall between biology and engineering led him to found the Center for Interdisciplinary Bioinspiration in Education and Research, or CYBER, for at UC Berkeley. The center's goal is to train young scientists from different disciplines to collaborate with each other early on in their careers. Paul Berkmeyer is a graduate student researcher in Ron Fearing's Biomimetic Millisystems Lab. He's been tasked with designing a very small robot that can be built quickly and cheaply. As part of the cyber group, Berkmeyer has been able to use data he collects from studies of real cockroaches to help understand how very small animals can move so efficiently. When I went to cyber, uh, I really was thrown in with a bunch of biologists 
and they they just think in a different yeah, manner. Yeah, like with engineers, it's uh, a lot about results and basically refining different methods and uh, approaches. But with biology, it's uh, coming up with a brand new hypothesis and trying to validate that through testing. Um, so it, it gave me a, a very different approach to how to solve problems. It will probably take years before these tiny robots will be as fast, small, and powerful as their real-life cousins. But remember, nature has required untold generations of accidental mutation to create organisms with these amazing capabilities. As long as we ensure there are still things to study, there's no limit to the mysteries we may unlock. Clearly, diversity enables discovery. When we look at this incredible library of design ideas sitting out there in nature, we see something that is truly extraordinary if we can keep those organisms alive. If we can preserve their environment, then it's possible we can extract their secrets to benefit us, uh, other organisms, and our environment. Keep Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org quest.